I've been a practicing radiologist for 20 years. Uh, about 15 of those years, I was specializing in pediatrics. And this is the number that keeps me awake at night. So let me explain. All this started with a visit from a friend of mine from medical school. I hadn't seen him in 17 years. Uh, he was practicing in Australia, I kind of knew that. So he calls me up and said, I'm actually touring the US and I'd like to come to your hospital. Can you set up a couple of appointments with your colleagues for me? And I'd like to spend the night in your house if that's okay. I said, sure, come on over. And uh, he came, we reminisced, and the next day he met his colleagues. We came back home for lunch, and it was time for him to leave. And he paused at the door, and he turned back and said, is it okay if I make a couple of personal comments? I said, sure, what is it? I said, I was jet lagged last night, and um, I couldn't help observing a few things and I wanted to share them with you. I said, sure. Uh, do you know what I do? I said, yeah, you're the pediatric sleep guy. you know. And uh, do you know how sleep works? Uh, I know there's REM sleep and non-REM sleep. I have to confess, I don't know much about it. And uh, he said, I was observing a few things yesterday. And I noticed, you know, you, would you describe that routine as typical? I said, yeah, it's typical. I like to come home, and then we spend some time with the kids, and then have a late dinner. I usually have a glass of wine with dinner, and then I have a nice big TV in my bedroom, and I catch up on the shows or news, and then I basically just doze off. And um, he said, I noticed that you also woke up early in the morning and you were working. I said, yeah, I find it difficult to sleep beyond 4 o'clock, and I find myself very refreshed and I write all my papers at the time. I, f I find it the most productive part of my life. And then he shook his head and said, I'm afraid you're messing up your life. I said, wow, that's quite a judgment coming from someone I haven't met in 17 years. But <laughs> please explain. And he said, there are about four groups in the world currently working on this type of research. And um, when you actually have a late dinner, you have a glass of wine, it's a sedative. And then you're watching TV, which is a stimulant. And then you fatigue yourself to sleep. Then you're essentially ensuring that you don't go through your required cycles of REM and non-REM sleep. And then when you wake up early in the morning, you're essentially depriving yourself of a big chunk of REM sleep, which happens early in the morning. I said, yep, I realize my sleep quality is bad, but, you know, as they say, there's plenty of time to sleep after you're dead. There's work to be done. And he said, well, basically this is what we know so far, that there is a strong link between sleep quality and sleep deprivation and Alzheimer's disease. And I was stunned to hear that. And this is the first time I was hearing about it. And uh, he said, this is the biggest silent epidemic of our times. And the numbers are going to make our obesity epidemic and the opioid epidemic look like child's play. So he left. I, I, I consider myself a respectful skeptic. And I looked up the literature. I tried to find evidence to back up his claims. I didn't find any. This was in 2010. And, um, but I still respected his words. I changed my life. I got rid of the TV in the bedroom. If I had a glass of wine, I would have it at 6 o'clock so that its effect wore off before I went to sleep. I started mind, mindfulness yoga and uh, to kind of put my body in a position to go to sleep. I was keeping an eye on the literature. By 2014, some papers started coming out. It's a little trickle showing a link between sleep deprivation and Alzheimer's. And now it's a steady stream. And I became frustrated. And I said, scientists have known this for eight years now. How come there is no urgency out there to change? I mean, this impacts all of us, all my kids. You know, think about the magnitude of this problem. Why aren't we doing something more? And everybody I talked to, scientists, teachers, they all said, 
unfortunately, our system, our healthcare system, is set up to cure people, not to prevent disease. And Oprah has a better chance of changing the sleep habits of our US population than our healthcare system does. And that was sadly true. We have essentially deprived ourselves of a system that can take an innovation and translate it to impact because of the system that we set up right now. So that made me think about what are the other opportunities out there, profound observations that we are not heeding. And I didn't have to look far, something that strikes close to home. The opioid epidemic, it strikes really close to home, is probably one of the most clear and present dangers of our time. Our country has already lost a half a million people to this epidemic. So it is easy for us to think that this suddenly sprang up on us in the last few years. But if you go back and say it started in the early 90s, it had already reached epidemic proportions by the end 90s. And do you want to know when the first scientific papers on this came out? 1998. And this was considered a serious enough problem that the journal of this, the editor of this journal, wrote an editorial on this topic. So when did we do something about it? It took 17 years before President Obama signed the Opioid Addiction and Recovery Act in 2016. The 17 is one of the weirdest coincidences in medicine. It so happens that that is the time it takes for a idea that's been validated in healthcare for it to make its way to guidelines for us to practice. That's how long it takes. And that's also the time it takes for drug development, for a drug going from concept to getting approved for use in a certain condition. That's too long. The problem, ladies and gentlemen, is not with innovation. It is with impact related to that innovation. And it's not just a question of impact. There is a lot of innovation that doesn't even make it to a publication. I go to my national meetings every year. We present about a thousand abstracts between all the radiology meetings combined on pediatric imaging. I'm sure every other society does the same. Do you know what percent of those ideas, innovations, actually make it to a publication? It's about 30%. It's one third. That's a lot of innovation being wasted. This is how the healthcare system is meant to work. It's beautifully designed conceptually. We are meant to go from the patient to sharing anonymized data in patient registries, which accumulates the data and then derives insights. And then we analyze the data, make conclusions, which make their way back via clinical guidelines and clinical decision support to the practitioner to enhance their insight and their care. But this is the way it actually works. We are unfortunately very similar to the blind man and the elephant. So we do not have a central system that is constantly taking insights, evaluating them, and adapting them for impact with a greater good in mind. The person in front, the insurance company, one at the leg, the pharmaceutical companies, that's not their job. Their job, they have one true north, profitability. They have their own agendas, and they have their hands full doing them. The third person there, the hospital system, the doctor way out in the back, they barely have time dealing with people coming through their doors. The community is in their mind, but they don't have the bandwidth or the resources to cater to its needs. So in the end, we don't have a system that is actually taking innovations and thinking of impact from a global standpoint. And the hospitals themselves are a pretty siloed entity. 
So we, as we get more and more specialized, the silos increase. And when you take an innovator and the hospital leadership, the innovators are trained to break rules and take risks. The hospital leadership is trained to make rules and avoid risks. They are like fire and water. So the only option left to the innovator who has made a profound observation is to either get some grant funding or sell that idea to a vendor who might be interested in marketing it or market it themselves with a startup company. Now, I work in pediatrics, and our pediatric market is pretty niche. It's a small market. So most ideas that we have, they, it's very difficult to bring them to the market. The challenges are immense. Funding is another challenge. I work in diagnosis. The NIH barely has money to fund treatments. They don't have money to fund diagnoses. So as a result, most of the innovations that happen in my field, unfortunately, stay restricted to where they originated. Scaling rarely happens. So this is one of the innovations I had the privilege of being involved in. So this is the famous Mata twins from Texas Children's Hospital. And they were conjoined throughout their chest, abdomen, and pelvis. And I worked with a brilliant group of scientists, physicians. So we actually created a three-dimensional model and a 3D printed model, which incorporated information from nine different organ systems and brought it together into one model, which allowed the surgeons to then precisely separate the different organs in order to create a very successful repair. Thank you. But such stories, unfortunately, get touted as miracle stories, one off a max of our scientific community. And it belies the fact that such innovation is readily available today in most major institutions. We can do this, but because of a system that is not able to productize these innovations and make it available that cannot scale, most children today get left out of the most innovations that are available today. So in the meantime, we face pressures of utilization, of cost cutting. And um, there is a recent rule that an insurance company passed, which is usually known to be very aggressive about cost cutting, that said that they do not want children greater than 10 years of age to be treated or diagnosed, uh, get their CT scans and MRIs at children's hospitals because they feel that specialist care costs too much. And they recommend that they get treated at outpatient imaging centers meant for adults. Now, I don't have a problem with companies wanting to cut costs, but using very broad sweeps with blunt instruments ends up running the risk of causing harm that is unintended. I'll give you an example. So this is a adult hospital which sees a large number of kids. And they acquired a new technology in 2012. And the radiation dose that was associated with every CT scan that they did in their children stayed high, relatively speaking. And then towards the end of last year, they requested our help, and we got involved. And using a group of their own specialists who were trained, and then incorporating pediatric specialists into the mix, we were able to cause a 90% reduction in the radiation dose related to a CT scan without any new technological innovation. This is purely based on training and process change. So when you take specialists out of the mix, out of the mix this is the risk you run. <clears throat> so it is time to change the status quo. It is time for innovators and leaders to decide enough is enough, that we are going to take ownership of impact of our own innovation. How are we going to do that? 
So this is a model that is a logical way to think about this. How do we take an innovation to impact? It starts off with reflect. So you need a breeding ground for ideas. So you reflect on it. Maybe create an organized way to bring ideas, pressing needs to the fore. And then once you've decided that there is a problem that requires a solution, you innovate. We are very good at that. The key is then to integrate into the system. You need a system that is constantly ready for its innovations. And that is the challenge we're going to talk a little bit more about. And once you've integrated it successfully, it is important to standardize. Today, we are so siloed that the care you receive in every hospital for the same condition is going to be slightly different from each other. And it is part of the autonomy that the physician has, which is a critical piece of the physician-patient relationship and the nuances that we face when we treat patients. But at the same time, there's a lot we can do about standardizing care. So once you've standardized, only then you share. Because right now, our ability to share data is also quite limited because of regulatory hurdles. And then you evaluate. You see how well that solution is working. And once you find something that works, then you educate. You teach people how to use it. And finally, you expand to the community where the patients are. And that's scaling. So we call that the RICE model. And I'll give you an example of how we employed it in our practice. We essentially changed our mission. We said we no longer are purely concerned just about diagnoses or imaging signatures. We are concerned about changing children's lives. And we want to do that through innovative imaging. So we're constantly looking to do what we do better. We created a daily huddle. So this is where we briefly bring thought leaders every day into a common area. We talk about the workflow for the day. And we also talk about opportunities for improvement. And we quickly assign ownership. And then we come up with a timeline for solution. The next piece is identifying the problem, putting it in the hands of the innovators, and letting them find solutions for it. And then comes integration. So how did we manage that? That is the pressing challenge of our times. How do we integrate innovations? Every hospital or institution has a quality improvement program. It is just a matter of asking, whatever we do, how can we do it better? That's the sense of quality improvement. 